thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I've been hearing all about the fantastic space course that you guys have been on, and I can't wait to hear your show in a little bit. Um, but before we do that, I just want to do a very quick talk telling you a little bit about some of the space science that I've been involved in. Um, so just by way of a very quick background, uh, my name is Harriet. So when I grew up, when I was your ages, um, when I was a little bit younger, I used to love space and astronomy. And I was really lucky. My dad, let's imagine this is my dad, this is me. We used to have a little telescope in our back garden and my dad would point out all the different constellations in the night sky. And so ever since I was younger, I always loved space. And it was something I always wanted to study. So I went to university and I studied mathematics because mathematics is the language of the universe. So if you want to do science and you want to understand space, you need to use maths to understand exactly what is going on. So I did that for a couple of years. Oh, oh wait, oh yeah. Um, and now what I've been doing for the last year is I've been studying the planet Jupiter. So this isn't, yeah, no, you can see this, right? You can see what this is, yeah? So this is the planet Jupiter. So planet Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. It's absolutely ginormous. So each of these storms that you see here, this storm here is called the Great Red Spot. And that is a storm on Jupiter that's about two times as big as the Earth. So if you imagine that instead of the Earth being a planet, it was twice as big and it was a giant storm, it would look just like that on the surface of Jupiter. So that's pretty cool, huh? And so what I've been doing over the last year is trying to understand all the different types of storms that we see on Jupiter. And so the reason that we can do this is thanks to a spacecraft that is orbiting around Jupiter right now. So this guy here, this is the Juno spacecraft. And so NASA, the American Space Agency, spent, sent this spacecraft to Jupiter all the way. It took five years to get there. That's because Jupiter is super, super far away. Um, and what it's doing is it's orbiting around Jupiter. And so, OK, I'm going to do a little experiment here. And I need a couple of volunteers. Does anyone want to volunteer? OK, right. I'm going to go with Layla number one. Up you get. OK, so uh, I'll, I'll, Layla number one and number two. Great. OK, right, come on. OK, so I'm going to give one of you. One, which one of you wants to be Jupiter? And which one of you wants to be the Earth? Jupiter. You can be Jupiter? Jupiter. Oh, it's going to be too hard. OK. Okay, right, so, right, you can be Jupiter for now, and you guys can swap later. Okay, right, so if you want to turn and face everyone. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if we sw shrunk Jupiter down to this size, Jupiter would be about this big, okay. Mm -hmm. How big do you think the Earth would be if we shrunk it down by the same amount? Do you think it would be this big, this big, this big, this, this big? big? This big, You think it's the same size? Remember, Jupiter's really big, so the Earth's going to be smaller, right? Keep going. Should I keep going? Anyone know how big the Earth should be? This big little do do do. Oh, I see someone's got their hands really close together. Okay, you got the right answer because the Earth would be this big. This would be the Earth if that was Jupiter. Okay, so you get to be the Earth. Okay, there you go, right? Okay, now let's imagine that Jupiter is this big and the Earth is this big. How far apart do you think they are in space? I think they'd be Yeah, you think they'd be this far apart? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Anyone else? Do you think they'd be closer, further apart? Further apart. OK, right. Come on, Layla. Let's move this way. OK? Keep going. Jupiter, you stay where you are. OK, this far or further? Further. Even further. OK, come on, Layla. Oh, keep going. <laughs> right. This far? A little bit further. OK, I'm going to stop it there because it's a trick question because we'd have to make Layla walk two miles yeah. until they were far enough apart. So Earth and Jupiter are really, really far apart. And that shows you how big space is. OK, well done, Layla's. You can sit down. You can keep your Earth. You can keep your Jupiter. Excellent. OK, round of applause for Layla's. OK, so uh, Jupiter is really big. It's really cool. We have these amazing storms on it. And so what? I've been working on is discovering new storms. So 
every time we've seen Jupiter so far, we go round its equator. So that's kind of like looking at the middle of the planet. And we haven't been able to see what's at the north and the south pole of Jupiter until we got this Juno spacecraft. So the Juno spacecraft discovered that these are, there are these amazing storm systems at the south pole of Jupiter. And this is actually a picture of the south pole of Jupiter. So this isn't exactly what it would look like if you looked with your eyes. What we're looking at here is through infrared light. So instead of the visible light that you see with your eyes, this is infrared light, which is just a slightly different type of light. But it's exactly the same concept. And here you can see there's five storms around the outside and one storm in the middle. And each of these storms is 4,000 kilometers across. So that's kind of like the distance from here to New York or something like that. So it's like really, really big, each of these storms. And so what I've been doing in my research has been trying to understand why we get these storms looking the way they do. Because on the Earth, if you had two storms really close together, what would happen is they just merge into each other and they just turn into like one superstorm. But we've been looking at these storms, yeah, exactly, right, yeah. <laughs> um, but we've been looking at these storms for over a year now, almost two years, and they stay in this really regular pattern. And so what we're trying to do is understand what is going on. And so to do that, we do science, as every good scientist does. And so what we do is we try and turn this problem into a science question, and we do a scientific experiment. So we take our image of what Jupiter looks like, and instead of working with Jupiter itself, because, you know, Jupiter is really big, it's really far away, and these storms take ages to move, so we can't use them as our experiment. We have to create our own experiment in a computer. So what we do is we take this image and we create a computer simulation that essentially recreates what we see at Jupiter, but instead of doing it with the actual planet, we do it with our computer. And then, if we're lucky, yes, what we can do is run these computer simulations. So here is one of the computer simulations that I did. And what you can see is instead of all these storms staying in this nice pattern like we see on Jupiter, they all kind of fly apart, right? And it all kind of goes wrong. And so that's one of the fun parts about science is you never really know how it's going to work out. And that's why you've got to do lots of different experiments to try and test what's going on and understand what's happening. So. This is the kind of thing that I've been doing, is trying to understand how these storms exist and why they're so weird and wonderful. So if any of you guys have any suggestions, I'd really like to hear them. OK. So one of the really cool things about space is that it's really, really awesome, right? OK. So here, this is the dwarf planet Pluto. So this is an actual picture of Pluto that we took with the New Horizons spacecraft. So this is a spacecraft that left the Earth like 15 years ago and it's been flying all that way through the solar system and a couple of years ago it went past Pluto, it said hello, it took this lovely picture and just a few days ago it went past what's called a Kuiper Belt object. So the Kuiper Belt is the furthest outside part of the solar system and it's full of these asteroids and meteorites. And this is one of them. It's called Ultima Thule. And this is a meteorite that is kind of, kind of looks like a snowman, right? Does anyone else see the snowman? Yeah. yeah. And so this picture was only taken a few days ago. And this spacecraft pinged it all the way back to Earth, four billion miles back to where it came from. Now these pictures here, these aren't real science pictures, right? This is an artist impression of what it would look like on our nearest exoplanet. So I heard you guys have been learning about exoplanets as well. So hands up if anyone can tell me what an exoplanet is. Yes. A planet out of our solar system. Exactly, a planet out of our solar system. So this planet isn't orbiting around the sun like Earth and Mars and Venus and Jupiter. It's orbiting around this star here, which is called Proxima Centauri. So that is the star that is the closest to the Earth. And we now know that there is uh, one planet going around this star, and it's about three light years away. So that means that if you were traveling at the speed of light, it would take three years for you to get from the Earth all the way to what this planet is here. And someone here has drawn like a nice uh, artist impression of what it might look like 
on that planet. And here is another one as well. And the point I wanted to make here is you get so many incredible space pictures that come through the internet. And sometimes it can be really hard to tell which ones are real and which ones aren't real, you know, because they all look so realistic. And the way that we try and tell the difference between what is real and what is not is by using the scientific method, which is what all of you guys have been doing in your course. So the scientific method, super simple. You ask a question, you make an observation, you form a hypothesis. So that means you have a guess or an idea about what you think the answer to that question might be. You then conduct an experiment, you analyze the data, and then you draw a conclusion, OK? And so this is done in a whole host of areas in space. This is a picture of a woman called Jocelyn Bell Brunel. Jocelyn Bell Brunel. She was a scientist at the University of Cambridge. She built her own telescope. Um, and her telescope was designed to detect radio waves. So these are the kind of waves that you use when you're listening to the radio in the car, things like that. Um, and she wanted to detect, uh, she wanted to use these radio waves to understand the universe and understand the galaxy that we live in. And so what she'd do, she built her telescope and she detected these different radio waves. So you can see this line, this is the data that she's getting in from her telescope. Um, and there's this kind of funny thing going on here that she discovered. Right? There's this little kind of extra spike in the data that she wasn't really sure what it was. And so when she saw this, she actually called the signal LGM1, which stood for little green men, OK? Because she didn't understand what this signal was. So she thought, well, maybe it's aliens. Maybe I'm the first person on the Earth to discover aliens. But as all you scientists know, right, extraordinary claims require, oh no, you can't see it. You can read it on the ceiling and then continue, okay? Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So this means if, if Jocelyn Belbonnel was gonna say something as extraordinary as I've discovered aliens, she needs to have some pretty impressive evidence to make sure that that's true. So before going to all the news outlets in, across the world and telling everyone that she discovered aliens, she did a lot more work, she did some more experiments, she tested her data, she went through the whole scientific method, and what she realized is that her strange little signal, when she was walking, oh, sorry, when she was um, looking at the signal, the signal moved across the night sky with the stars. And from that, she knew that that signal wasn't coming from the Earth, because if it was from coming from the Earth, it would stay in the same place. And the other thing she realized is that she discovered another signal somewhere else in the, in the other side of the solar system, in the other side of the galaxy. And from that, she realized, well, if there's little green men talking to me on one side of the galaxy, it's pretty unlikely that they're also on the other side of the galaxy talking to me as well. And so what she realized is that she hadn't discovered little green men. She'd actually discovered a new type of star. So. This is called a pulsar, and what a pulsar does is it has this giant jet of light that comes out on each of the ends, and it spins around really, really quickly. And so it's kind of like a lighthouse. So in the same way that a lighthouse has a light spinning around, every time you, you know, wait like five seconds for that light to come around, then... The, um, then you see that light. And it's exactly the same with these pulsars, except for these pulsars are super, super heavy, super small stars that are spinning millions and millions of light years away, which is pretty cool, right? OK, so we go back to this scientific method, because what's really cool about the scientific method is that you don't just have to use it for big, complicated science questions. You can also use it for really simple questions, with things like, how did I get to Birmingham today? Okay, so when I was trying to figure out how I could get here from London, I went through the scientific method. I asked a question, how do I get to Birmingham? Okay, then I made an observation. Okay, one, Birmingham is a little bit far away from London. I can't just walk there, okay? So what kind of transport am I gonna use? I formed a hypothesis. 
Okay. Hypothesis one is I cycle to Birmingham. <laughs> Hypothesis two is that I get the train to Birmingham. Okay. These are two good options, right? Okay. So hands up. Do you think I should get the train to Birmingham? Yeah. Do you think I should cycle to Birmingham? Okay. We've got some very exercise enthusiasts in the audience. This is great. Okay. So next thing I do, I do an experiment, right? I go on Google Maps. I see how far it's going to take me to cycle and get the train to Birmingham. And then I analyze the data and I draw a conclusion. OK, spoilers here. So I did my science. OK, we have hypothesis one. I cycled to Birmingham. OK, guess how long it would take to cycle from London to Birmingham, guys? Ten hours. You are good at reading. It is 10, ten hours and 30 minutes. OK, it's 126 miles. That would take me quite a long time. I would have had to set off at 3 a.m. in the morning to get here, OK? No spoilers, but I had a little bit more sleep than that, OK? The other thing I could do, hypothesis number two, I could get the train, OK? Good old National Rail tells me it's going to take less than two hours on the train, and I can sit and read a book. It's great. OK, so big time difference. And this is science, right? This is exactly what we're doing. Every single day, we're using science and the scientific method to help us make decisions about the ways that we live our lives. So everyone in this room is a scientist. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I just want to bring it back to space um, because that's the whole point of this workshop, right? Is space and what has space done for us? So again, I want to put a question out to the audience. What do you? Oh no, the Earth is <laughs> <has> gone. <laughs> OK, so hands up if you can think of something that space has done to help you in your everyday life. Yes? It gave us gravity. Yeah, exactly, right? If we didn't have the universe around us, if we didn't have science, then we wouldn't know about gravity. We wouldn't be stuck to the ground right now. We'd be floating off. Fantastic. Yes, Layla? It gives us a world. Yeah, exactly. If we didn't have space, then one, we wouldn't have all these cool planets to discover, right? Um, we wouldn't have nice stars to look at in the night sky. If we yeah. didn't have the sun. Yeah, if we didn't have the sun, then we wouldn't have daytime, which means that it would be pretty cold the whole time. And if we didn't have the sun, then we would just be, you know, we wouldn't be able to go around it. We would just be, you know, floating through the galaxy, um, kind of homeless. It'd be a little bit sad. Yeah. Yeah, okay. So what would be what do we need the moon for? Do you, can you think of anything that's useful for the moon? Why do we need the moon? Because it it's it helps us gives us light when it's night. Yeah, it does that, but it's not very good, is it? It's still quite dark at night. Any anything yeah. else that the moon is useful for? I'll give you a suggestion. It's a little hint. Uh, <laughs> okay, I need to be better on my hips. Okay, yes, okay. Tides, yes, exactly, yeah. So we need the moon to give us tides. If we didn't have the moon there, then we wouldn't have this giant lump of rock going around the earth, pulling, using gravity, pulling the water away from the surface of the earth, which is what gives us tides. I don't know how useful tides are, but like we wouldn't have them otherwise. So. <laughs> yes, okay, one more and then we'll move on. We wouldn't have science. We wouldn't have science, exactly, right? And science is so important because, as we said, it's the way that we understand the universe around us. So I guess that's kind of like a little loop, right? If we didn't have science, then we wouldn't know <coughs> things. And if we didn't know the things, then we wouldn't have science. Okay, here's some other things that space has given us, okay? So if we didn't have space, you would not have... Netflix, YouTube, all these things on TV, okay? So the reason for that is that all of these things rely on the internet and satellites. So right now there are hundreds, if not thousands, of... I'm going to have to capture the Earth, otherwise it's going to keep... <laughs> okay, if we didn't have all these satellites around the Earth, then we wouldn't be able to have things like uh, satellite TV, Google Maps wouldn't work because Google Maps uses satellites to tell us about where we are in the world. We wouldn't have the internet because, again, the internet uses satellites. That's the way we get data from across the world really, really quickly. And we wouldn't have this nice gentleman telling us what the weather is like in Australia. In fact, we wouldn't have weather forecasts anywhere because, again, we use space to be able to look at what the weather is like across the world and that helps us make predictions every single day. Okay, 
Oh yeah, okay, I forgot I had this. So this is really cool. So this is amazing. This is a picture of an island in Indonesia. This picture was taken on the 17th of December, okay? And it was taken by a satellite in space. This isn't a picture that was taken from the ground. This is taken from a satellite really, really high up, orbiting the Earth. And as it went past this island, it took a picture. And what we can see is over the course of a few pictures, you can see this volcano erupting over the course of a week. And this is incredible because these kind of images are really, really useful if we want to understand disaster events, if we want to understand volcanoes or earthquakes or landslides or tsunamis. Being able to take pictures of the Earth every single day like this help us to understand what these events are and how much damage they're going to cause. Yes, so question. this was all recent. Yeah, so this has taken, this, this photo, this one right here, was taken on the 2nd of January, three days ago. And so this is really, really powerful stuff because you can take a picture of the Earth and this company, Planet, they have satellites orbiting the Earth across the world and they take a picture of the Earth every single day. And that means that you can look at how your crops are changing. If you're a farmer, you can look at how much your crops are growing over the course of the year and that can help you plan your business. If yes. you live in Indonesia, it can show you how this volcano is changing and whether you need to evacuate your home and save thousands of lives. So the, all this kind of stuff is because we've got satellites in space that can help us <laughs> with this information. Okay, final slide. So you guys have all been doing space. Okay, hands up if you like space and you've enjoyed your course. Okay, that's great news. Because if you enjoy space, then there are so many things that you can do with it, okay? And being interested in space doesn't mean that you have to be an astronaut. It doesn't mean you have to be a rocket scientist. But you can be an astronaut, right? You can be like Tim Peake. Or you could be a rocket scientist. And you could be like this girl here, who is a real NASA astronaut. Oh, sorry, rocket scientist, okay? There's so many different things you can do, right? And it's not just about becoming um, a rocket scientist or an astronaut. You can um, be an astronomer and you can go to places like this and work on telescopes and look at the farthest parts of the galaxy. You can work for rocket companies and learn how to land spacecrafts and land rockets on ships, which is pretty amazing. You could be like Brian Cox and you could be on TV and explain science to everyone else in the country. Um, you could be an artist, so if you like space and you like art, you could be a space artist, right? And you could have your job be imagining these science worlds and drawing them for everyone else. You could be a writer and you could write about the latest space news. And there's so many different things that you can do if you're interested in space. So the only piece of advice I have for you today is find that thing that you're passionate about and Keep studying, keep following it, and you never know where you might end up. Um, so that's all from me. Thank you very much. I would love to take as many questions as I possibly can. Thank you. Should we give a round of applause? <laughs> yes. How long would it take to get to Mars? Ah, oh, great question. OK, so to get to Mars, it takes about eight months which is kind of a long time, right? But the reason is for that is you have to wait for the planets to line up. So if you imagine, okay, Layla, I'm gonna need your help. Okay, right, so imagine, oh, I need both Laylas, okay, great. Right, so I'm gonna be the sun, okay? You're gonna be the Earth and you're gonna be Mars, okay? And I both want you to both run around me, okay? But at different speeds, okay. Oh, this is great. Okay, so if you imagine that this Layla is the Earth and this is Mars, the problem is that you want to make sure that the Earth and Mars line up. Because you don't want to, oh gosh, you don't want to <laughs> launch from the Earth when Mars is on the other side of the Sun, right? You want to wait, wait, oh yeah, catch up, come on, keep going. You run a little bit slower, you run a little bit faster. You want to make it so that they're both right next to each other, right? And so that happens every two, okay, you can stop running now, great job, great job. Okay, we can keep going. <laughs> so what you want to do is you have to wait for the Earth and Mars to be at the same place. And so that happens every two years. And basically the alignment works such that it takes, no matter really whenever you want to go, it takes about eight months to get there. So, yeah.
I guess, okay, question for you guys. If you knew it was going to take you eight months to get to Mars and then eight months to come home, hands up if you'd still want to go and visit. <laughs> yeah? Yeah, I think I would as well. Yeah. It'd be a nice year holiday. Okay, any more questions? Yes. Whoa, great question. Okay, so we saw that picture of Pluto earlier, right? So there was a spacecraft that went all the way to Pluto. Um, and it took like 12 years to get there. That's a really long time. Like, how old are you now? Six. You're six. So you would be 18 by the time you got to Pluto. And then what about like another 12 Let's see if I can do the maths. Then you'd be 30 by the time you got home. Do you still want to go? Yeah? yeah? OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK, yes, question. How long would it take to get to Uranus? Uranus. Okay, so that isn't quite as far as Pluto. So that would probably take you like 10 or 11 years. So yeah. Okay, yes, Ada. What's your question? Yeah. So what was that about the Earth? How could be life on this planet? Oh, so Layla's question is, I think, how can there be life on the Earth? Is that right? Because we haven't discovered life anywhere else in our solar system. So that makes the Earth really, really special, right? Because not only does it have small little bugs, it also has people and complex civilizations. And like, that's pretty extraordinary. And we haven't discovered anything like that anywhere else. So the Earth is pretty special for a lot of reasons. One of them is because it's in what's called the Goldilocks zone. So, you know, it's not too close to the sun, like Mercury. Mercury gets really, really hot. And it's not too far away from the sun, like Pluto, which is really, really, really cold. It's just right. And so that temperature means that we can have liquid water on the Earth. And that's one of the things that's really important for life. Layla. What's the furthest planet from the sun? Oh, that's a great question. OK, so that's quite a contentious one. Because if you'd asked me 10 years ago, I would have said it's Pluto. But now we think, actually, that Pluto isn't really a planet. It is. Oh, well, OK, maybe it, it's not. Yeah, so the reason why, and this is really interesting, because really, at the end of the day, it's def just a definition, right? But Pluto is really, really small, and we actually know that there's a lot of other, what we call dwarf planets, really close to Pluto as well. So the Earth has its own path around the Sun, right? Nothing else is getting in the way. But with Pluto, it's not just Pluto, it's also um, Makemake and Haumea and all these other dwarf planets that can be even bigger than Pluto still going around the Sun at the same distance. So uh, I would probably say that Neptune is the furthest planet, but there's lots and lots of dwarf planets like Pluto there as well.